Welcome to Discrete Differential Geometry. Today we're going to talk about one of the most fundamental objects in geometry and also in physics, which is the Laplace operator and its generalization to curved spaces, the Laplace-Beltrami operator. If you've never heard of this before, that's okay. Our goal today is to build some basic intuition for what the Laplace-Beltrami operator is and what it means. So one basic way to think about Laplace-Beltrami is that it is a generalization of the ordinary Laplacian from Euclidean space to curved domains. And we're going to refer to this just for brevity as just the Laplacian and use the capital delta as a symbol for the Laplacian. Now you might also see in, in other places, especially in physics, some people like to write the Laplacian as nabla squared, but for us we're going to reserve this symbol for the Hessian, a different operator that has an important relationship to the Laplacian. The Laplacian shows up all over the place in geometry and physics. It was originally studied by Pierre-Simon Laplace, who was trying to understand the force of gravity, for instance, the force that the Earth exhibits on other bodies in the solar system. Discrete Laplacians, which we'll study in our next lecture, are used all over the place in algorithms, whether it's in physical simulation, in studying graphs and networks, in machine learning, and for us, we'll be especially interested in geometry processing, but really all over the place. Why are discrete Laplacians so useful for computation? Well, for one thing, they reduce a lot of important problems to just solving sparse linear equations. And this is a basic task for which we already have lots of existing code, lots of algorithms, things that have been optimized really well. So the Laplacian is a really powerful abstraction for doing all kinds of different computing. In physics, the Laplacian provides a basic model for a wide variety of physical behavior. One important equation is the heat equation, which describes, for instance, how temperature diffuses throughout an environment over time. If we then imagine that the temperature at the boundary is fixed and consider the equilibrium distribution of temperature, we get the Laplace equation. And we can also use the Laplacian to model the behavior of waves. So how do displacements propagate throughout a material. On top of these basic linear equations, we can add more interesting features and nonlinearities to model lots of different systems. And really, the Laplacian you'll see show up over and over again in physical systems, in elasticity, in quantum mechanics, everywhere. Likewise, the Laplacian pops up all over geometry. In Differential geometry and mesh processing, well, we've already seen that the Laplacian is one way of talking about the mean curvature of a surface. It's really useful for studying and processing surfaces because it's isometry invariant, meaning if we do motions of the surface, if we bend a surface in a way that doesn't change point-to-point -point distances along the surface, then the Laplacian will be preserved. And that's a very useful property when studying the relationship between different shapes. We'll also see that the Laplacian gives us a natural sense of frequencies on the surface. So just like we have cosines and sines that can be used to decompose functions on the real line, or we have spherical harmonics on the sphere, we're going to be able to use the Laplace-Beltrami operator to get a basis of these kind of frequency functions on any shape. And we're going to see a lot more properties, examples, and applications as we progress throughout the rest of the course. Okay, so what is the basic definition for Laplacian? Well, maybe you remember the definition of the Laplacian in Rn, which is that if we just have a scalar function on Rn, u, and it's twice differentiable, then one way to express the Laplacian is just the sum of all the second partial derivatives of u along the coordinate directions x sub i. So for instance, in 2D, if we have a function u of x and y, then the Laplacian of u is the second derivative of u along the x direction evaluated at x, y, plus the second derivative of u along the y direction evaluated at that same point, x, y. Okay?
So that's the basic definition. The Laplacian gives the sum of second derivatives along coordinate axes. And using this definition, we can go ahead and we can calculate what the Laplacian is for some example functions. So for instance, let's say we have a function u1 of xy, which is equal to minus x squared minus 2y squared, which is plotted on the right here. Then the Laplacian of that function is, okay, well, we just take the second derivative of long x plus the second derivative of long y. If we work that out, we get minus 2 minus 4, which is minus 6. All right, here's another example. A different function, u2 of xy, is equal to x cubed minus 3xy squared. If we calculate the Laplacian, well, again, we just take the second partial derivative with respect to x plus the second partial derivative with respect to y. If we work that out, we get 6x minus 6x, or 0. Okay, so that's kind of interesting. 0 is a pretty special number. It's pretty interesting that over the entire plane, the Laplacian of this function is 0. What does that tell us about the function? Right, we get to this point where we say, sure, we understand that the Laplacian can be expressed as the sum of second derivatives, but why is that interesting and what does it mean? So there are other ways to understand what the Laplacian means, and that's going to be a major goal of our lecture today. One thing that you might also remember from calculus is that second derivatives tell you something about convexity. So for instance, if I have now just a function u of x on the real line, then the Laplacian is, well, the sum of all the second derivatives, but in this case, there's just one second derivative, the second derivative along x. So what did it mean if that second derivative was positive or negative? Well, the idea, and you can see it from this picture, is that if the second derivative is greater than zero, then we have a convex region of the function. And if the second derivative is less than zero, then we have a concave region of the function. We can also be a little more quantitative about it and ask, well, what does the magnitude of the second derivative mean? And you might have some sense that this has something to do with the curvature of the function. How curved does it look? Okay, well, if you think back to our lecture on curves in the plane, one way of talking about curvature is to consider the osculating circle at a given point. So just like the tangent line is sort of the best fit line, the osculating circle is kind of the best fit circle. And we said that the curvature of the curve is one over the radius of this circle. So how does the second derivative relate to this curvature? Well, unfortunately, it's not quite as simple as saying the curvature is equal to the second derivative. If you go back and write out the expression for the curvature of the graph of this function, you'll find it also involves a term involving the first derivative. Okay? But at least at points where the first derivative is zero, so for instance at the maximum and minimum points of the function, the second derivative really is giving you the curvature. So that's some pretty good intuition for what the second derivative means. As we often do in this course, we can also try to understand the Laplacian by looking at a discrete analog. So in our next lecture, we'll talk a lot about discrete Laplacians, but for now, we can at least use the graph Laplacian as a useful analogy for understanding the Laplace Beltrami operator. So remember that a graph G is a collection of vertices V connected by edges E. A simple example might be every vertex represents a person in a social network and two people are connected by an edge if they are friends in this network. Okay? So now suppose we store a value u sub i at each vertex. Then the graph Laplacian, which we'll write as L, is going to give the deviation from the average value of all the neighbors j. Right? So we could write this as 
the graph Laplacian LU at vertex I is equal to 1 over the degree of the vertex, meaning how many edges touch it, times the sum over all neighboring values U sub J, right? That gives the average value at the neighbors, minus the value at I. So it's just kind of a silly example. If the values on the nodes encode the intelligence, the IQ or something of each person in the network, then the Laplacian says whether on average you're more or less intelligent than your friends. In fact, it says how much more or less intelligent on average. Okay, But whatever the data encodes, the key idea is that the graph Laplacian gives you the deviation from a local average. Okay, So that's pretty easy to understand for a graph. Can we go back and actually think about our continuous Laplace operators from this same point of view of deviation from a local average? Well, let's think about it. Let's go back to this function we had before and consider the value at some point x0 and the values at two nearby points, u of x0 plus epsilon and u of x0 minus epsilon. And if we draw a straight line segment between these two points on the graph, then the point right in the middle will represent the average value. And we can draw a little arrow that indicates the deviation of the value at u from this average value. Now, as we move the center point along the graph, this arrow is going to point up or down according to the convexity or concavity of the function, and the magnitude looks something like, well, the Laplacian of the function. So if we really plot this arrow as we move along the x-axis, we get a function that looks very much like the Laplacian. In fact, if we let epsilon go to zero, then this really is going to look exactly like the Laplacian. Okay? We can also use this same idea of deviation from the average for functions of multiple variables. Right? So in this case, the way of, of thinking about it perhaps is to say if we have a function u and we have a point x0, then we can think of the Laplacian as the difference between the value at that point, u of x0, and the average value over a small sphere around the point let's say a sphere of radius epsilon. So we could write that the Laplacian of u at x0 is proportional to the limit as epsilon goes to zero of the integral over the sphere around that point divided by the area of the sphere minus the value at the center. Okay, so the same idea. The Laplacian is the deviation from this local average. This point of view is really helpful now in understanding the behavior of various things we talked about before. So, for instance, we talked about the heat equation. So how can we think about the heat equation from the perspective of averaging? Well, the heat equation says that the change in a function value is equal to the Laplacian of the function. So then intuitively, at each point in time, values are going to move toward the average of nearby values. We're just going to take the function and then average it with a local neighborhood over and over and over again until eventually it becomes completely flat, completely constant. So the key idea is that concave bumps are going to get pushed down and convex bumps are going to get pushed up until the graph of this function is flat. We can build on this understanding of the heat equation to understand the Laplace equation. So let's say now we again solve the heat equation, so the change over time of u is equal to the Laplacian of u, but we also say that at all times t the values on the boundary are equal to some prescribed function g. Okay, And if we run this heat flow for a very long time, then eventually the value at every point will equal the average value in some small neighborhood of that point. 
the resulting function is called a harmonic function. And it's a solution to the Laplace equation. Laplace u is equal to zero. Going back to our graph analogy, this is kind of like saying, okay, if we're in this social network where the value on every node represents how intelligent all my friends are, then a harmonic function on this graph means that everybody is as intelligent as all their friends on average. Right? It's a very harmonious situation. Okay? So no matter how you think about it, a Laplace equation says that each value should be equal to the average of its neighbors. We can also understand the wave equation from this point of view. So the wave equation instead says that the change in velocity is equal to the Laplacian of the displacement. In other words, if a point is above its local average, it will experience a downward force. If it's below its local average, it'll experience an upward force. Okay, so this is great. This gives us a lot of intuition for what the Laplacian means, but how can we generalize this idea, this definition of the Laplacian to curved domains? How can we do differential geometry? Okay, so let's look at actually a bunch of different definitions for Laplace Beltrami and some of its basic properties. And we're gonna cover a lot of ground here we're going to look at a lot of different perspectives kind of very quickly. Okay? So there are many different definitions that we can use in the smooth setting to express the Laplacian. One we've already talked about is a deviation from a local average. We've already seen that the Laplacian, at least in Euclidean space, can be expressed as the sum of partial derivatives. We can also write the Laplacian as the trace of the Hessian, as the divergence of the gradient. We can write it in terms of differential forms. We can think of it as the sort of Hessian of the Dirichlet energy. And we can also connect it to random walks, to something called Brownian motion. So most of these, almost as written, in fact, already apply directly to curved domains. But let's take a look, a closer look, at exactly how that happens. In fact, the one definition that doesn't translate well to curved domains is this statement that it's just equal to the sum of partial derivatives, but we can come up with an analogous, more general expression. So remember that when we're talking about curved geometry, one of the most fundamental objects is the Riemannian metric, which tells us how to assign an inner product to any two tangent vectors. For instance, if we have an immersed surface F, a parameterized surface, then we can define the induced Riemannian metric, G, on two tangent vectors X and Y by pushing forward X and Y into space via the differential, and then just taking their ordinary inner product in three-dimensional space. No matter how we get the metric or what dimension of manifold we're working with, we can write the Laplace Beltrami operator this way. So we say that the Laplacian of a function u is equal to the sum from i equals one up to the dimension of the sum from j equals one up to the dimension of one over the square root of the determinant of g times the partial derivative in local coordinates along the ith direction of the square root of the determinant of g times the ijth entry of the inverse of the metric times the derivative of u along j. Ooh, what a mouthful. Okay, we can at least check that this is, in the Euclidean case, the same as what we saw before. So let's say that g is just the identity matrix, in which case g inverse is also the identity matrix. The determinant of g is equal to 1. And so if we plug this into the general expression on top, we'll see that the cross terms disappear and the Laplacian of a function is, hey, great, just the sum from i equals one up to n of the second derivatives along the coordinate directions. Now, I will say actually, this expression, although it is quite general, is really rarely used as a starting point for algorithms and numerical methods. Usually some of these other 
perspectives on the Laplacian provide a, a more useful starting point. So let's look at another fairly standard definition of the Laplacian, which is in terms of the Hessian. So you may remember that in Rn, the Hessian of a function u can be expressed as the matrix of all possible second partial derivatives. For instance, if u is a function in the plane, in coordinates x, y, then the Hessian of u, which we write as nabla squared u, is the matrix where in the upper left corner we have the second derivative along x, in the bottom right we have the second derivative along y, and then on the off diagonals we have the mixed partial derivatives. Second derivative of u along x and along y, which is equal to the second derivative along y and then x. One way of understanding the Hessian, of understanding what it means, is that loosely speaking, it provides sort of the best quadratic approximation of u around a point. So to be a little more precise, let's consider a function in one variable, u of x. Then at a point x0, I can approximate that function locally by taking the value at x0 plus the first derivative at x0 times the difference between the evaluation point x and x0 plus one half the square of that difference times the second derivative at x0. In other words, the second derivative, the Hessian, provides this quadratic part. We can do the same thing for a multivariable function. So we have a function u, and we want to approximate it around the point x0. Well, we can consider now the gradient and the Hessian of the function, and say that near the point x0, the function is pretty well approximated by the value at x0 plus the inner product of the gradient at x0 with a difference vector w plus one half the Hessian applied to the difference vector and then the inner product with that same difference vector. Okay, so again, the Hessian provides kind of the quadratic piece in this Taylor approximation. So what's the relationship to the Laplacian? Well, quite simply, the Laplacian is the trace of the Hessian. So in Rn, it's just the sum of the diagonal entries of that matrix. Again, if we have a function from the plane into R, then the trace of the Hessian is just the sum of the second derivative in the x direction plus the second derivative in the y direction. One thing we clearly see from this relationship is that the Hessian contains a lot more information than the Laplacian. We can also express the Hessian as the directional derivative of the gradient. So again, in the Euclidean case, in Rn, we could write this same Hessian this way. We could say the Hessian is something where we imagine we apply it to two vectors. If you want to think in more matrix notation, this would be like x transpose Hessian y. We're thinking of the Hessian as a bilinear form. Well, how does that bilinear form behave? It's the same as first taking the gradient of the function and then taking the directional derivative of the gradient along the x direction. So if I start at some point and start walking in the direction x, how is that gradient vector changing? The change in a vector along a direction is just another vector. And so we can take the inner product with y to get our final value for the Hessian. The reason for introducing this construction, this way of talking about the Hessian, is that it actually will generalize to a curved surface where we may not have a clear notion of coordinates. Okay. So the way we can define the Hessian for a curved surface is first take the exterior derivative of the function instead of the gradient. Okay, but still taking this kind of first derivative of the function. And then we take the covariant derivative of this resulting one form to define the Hessian. Actually, I'm going to hold off on 
talking too much about the covariant derivative because we'll see that later on when we talk about geodesics on manifolds. But the intuition is very much the same as in the Euclidean case. The covariant derivative is going to tell us how the differential of u is turning or changing as we move along the direction x. Okay, and so then the relationship between the Hessian and the Laplacian is the same. The Laplace Beltrami operator applied to a scalar function u is equal to the trace of the Hessian of u, or equivalently, the trace of the covariant derivative of the exterior derivative of u. So one thing you definitely get a sense of is there are a lot of different derivatives in differential geometry, um, but eventually they all start making sense how these are different and what their function is. We can also define the Laplacian, as is commonly done in vector calculus, in terms of the divergence of the gradient. So remember that for a scalar function u, the gradient gives the vector field that points in the direction of steepest ascent. So here I've plotted the graph of a function u over the plane, and in the plane, I'm plotting its gradient vector field. If we look at this vector field from above, what we notice is that maxima of this function become sinks in the gradient field, and minima of this function become sources in the gradient field. Okay. The divergence for any vector field is going to measure how much that vector field locally behaves like a sink or a source. In other words, how much is it spreading out or how much is it contracting inwards? So if we compose these two operations, if we take the gradient and then divergence, then we get the Laplacian, which is going to be positive near minima and negative near maxima. So that's the standard way of thinking about it in Rn. And actually, we can easily generalize this idea to manifolds using the gradient and divergence operators that we already looked at for curved domains. So remember that to express the gradient, the divergence, and the curl on curved domains, on curved surfaces, we used the exterior derivative d and the Hodge star star. In particular, we said that the gradient of a function u could be obtained by taking the differential of u and then applying the sharp operator, turning it from a one form into the corresponding vector field. The divergence can be expressed as star d star x flat. So for instance, if we're on a surface, we take our vector field x, we apply the flat operator, which gives us a one form. We apply the Hodge star on a one form, which rotates by 90 degrees. Then we take the exterior derivative, which gives us a two form. And then finally, that last Hodge star is going to map us from a two form back to a zero form or a scalar function. Okay, so if we want an expression for Laplace Beltrami, then all we have to do is compose these two operators, and maybe do a little simplification. In particular, the Laplacian of u is going to be equal to well, divergence of the gradient of u, which is, well, this looks kind of silly now, star d star of du sharp flat. Okay, so we're taking the differential of u, turning it into a vector field, and then turning it back into a one form. Well, we could just skip all that and write this as star d star du. Right? Really nice expression for the Laplacian. One thing that's nice about this expression is that for surfaces, it splits up geometric aspects of this operator. So we're saying that the zero form Hodge star, at least on a surface, is really the area form, the area of the surface. And the one form Hodge star is the conformal structure. It's telling us how to rotate vectors by 90 degrees. So this gets to be really useful when we do geometry processing to think about how to split up these computations. As a bonus, if we're already working in the framework of discrete exterior calculus, it's really easy to implement the Laplace Beltrami operator. We just multiply together the matrices that represent our discrete exterior derivative 
and our discrete Hodge star. Another really nice way of understanding the Laplacian is in terms of random walks. So there's a deep connection between the Laplacian and what's called Brownian motion. You can imagine this is just, you have a little particle and it's wandering around in the plane, making random increments in some random direction each time. And if we have lots of these little random walkers and consider their average behavior, right, the average location that we expect them to show up, then this is going to approach something called the heat kernel. So the heat kernel, k sub t of x, y, says how much heat got diffused from the point x to the point y after time t. And this is called the heat kernel because it is the fundamental solution to the heat equation. So what I mean by that is if I'm solving a heat equation, d dt of u equals Laplace u, with an initial condition, initial function that I start with, u at time zero is equal to phi, then I can express the solution at any time t and at any point x as a convolution, as the integral over the domain of the heat kernel times the initial function. This integral, by the way, is also the expected value of the function evaluated at the location of a random walker at time t. Right? So I let a particle take a random walk. At time t, I stop. Wherever that particle lands, I evaluate the function phi. And the expected value is the average value that I'll get from doing that. How can I connect this back to the Laplacian? Well, let's think about the heat equation at time zero. So at time zero, u is equal to phi. I'm going to flip the heat equation around and say that Laplace of phi is equal to the derivative of u, which I can write as a limit, the limit as time goes to zero of one over t times the difference between u at time t and u at the initial time. And because I know that u of t is equal to this expected value, what I learn is the Laplacian of a function phi is actually equal to the time derivative of its expected value as seen by a random walker. Okay, so we say that the Laplacian is the infinitesimal generator of this Brownian random motion. The intuition here is actually pretty simple. The intuition is just that we can think of the Laplacian of a function u as a difference between the function itself and a blurred out version of that function, a diffused version of that function. And in fact, that's an approximation you can use in practice. If you have some way of blurring out a function, you can subtract the original function, divide by t, and that gives you a pretty reasonable approximation of the Laplacian. Okay, one last way of looking at the Laplacian is in terms of the Dirichlet energy, which is the integral over the domain of the norm of the gradient of the function squared. Okay, what does this energy do? Well, if I have a function u that looks like this, its norm of gradient squared looks like this. So wherever the function is varying quickly, this norm is large. Wherever it's reasonably constant, this norm is small. And this energy is a pretty common notion of regularity or smoothness that shows up in geometry and physics and in algorithms. It's also a very natural starting point for discretization, uh, for instance, using finite element methods, which we will see when we talk about discretization of Laplace. What actually is the relationship between Dirichlet energy and the Laplacian? Well, we can use the Laplacian to express Dirichlet energy as a quadratic form. So this same energy that we've written in the box can also be written as the L2 inner product of the Laplacian of the function with the function itself. It can be written as the integral over the surface of the function times the Laplacian of the function. Okay, We're going to talk about this a fair bit more later today via a basic interpolation problem.
Before moving on, we should look at what are some basic important properties of the Laplace operator. One very basic property, whether we're in Euclidean space or on a curved domain, is that it has constant functions in the kernel. So if u is a function that has the same value c at every point, then the Laplacian of u is equal to zero. If we're in Euclidean space, then the Laplacian is also going to have linear functions in the kernel. Why is that true? Well, it's pretty straightforward. It's a sum of second derivatives. Linear functions don't have any second derivatives. Okay? But we don't really have this property on curved spaces because what does it mean for a function to be linear on a curved surface? Another very useful property of the Laplacian that we hinted at earlier is that it's invariant to rigid motion. So if I have a shape and I rotate it and translate it in space, this isn't going to change anything about how the Laplacian behaves. And that's really important, right? It'd be really strange if I got a different derivative depending on what coordinate system I chose. But more importantly, it's invariant to isometries. So an isometry is intuitively a deformation that doesn't change point-to-point -point distances along a surface, along a shape. A little more precisely, let's say that I have some initial surface F, and then I have a deformation eta. So my final parameterization of the surface is eta composed with F. For each of those maps, F and eta composed with F, I can compute an induced Riemannian metric. And if these two metrics are the same, then I say that the deformation eta was an isometry. For instance, if you bend your arms and your legs, that's pretty close to being an isometry. The metric doesn't really change much. And this is a really useful property in algorithms because it means that if I've already computed my Laplacian or solved for its eigenvectors and eigenvalues or done some other computation on some initial surface, that when I go and deform the surface isometrically, I don't have to redo all those computations. Okay? There are a lot of other reasons why this isometry invariance turns out to be a really useful property for shape analysis. Another basic property is that the Laplacian is self-adjoint. So a really good analogy is thinking of the Laplacian as behaving kind of like a symmetric matrix. If I do the inner product of Laplace u with v, I get the same thing as Laplace v with u. Or more precisely, the integral over the domain of u Laplace v is equal to the integral of v Laplace u. Finally, the Laplace is also an elliptic differential operator. And kind of a loose analogy here is that it behaves like a positive definite matrix. So for instance, if A is a positive definite matrix, then X transpose AX is positive for all X. And so if I graph this function, it looks like kind of a convex bowl. Well, likewise, if I take the inner product of Laplace U with U, then up to sign, it looks like a convex bowl. And what that means is if I'm defining energies and doing minimization in terms of the Laplacian, I have these nice convex energies where I can just ski to the bottom of this bowl to find the minimizer. Okay? So a lot of these properties are summed up by saying, you know, what should I remember about the Laplacian? I should remember that more or less it behaves like a positive semi-definite matrix. And that it's almost invertible. It has only really simple functions in its kernel, like constant functions. Okay. And because the Laplacian looks so much like a positive semi-definite matrix, we can look at its spectral properties as well. So you may have at some point been introduced to the spectral theorem in linear algebra, which says that if I have a real symmetric matrix A, a matrix that's equal to its transpose, then it's going to have real eigenvalues lambda and orthogonal eigenvectors E, 
that satisfy the eigenvector eigenvalue relationship. A E I is equal to lambda I E I. Applying the matrix to this vector does nothing more than scale it by some constant. Okay? Well, any self adjoint elliptic operator L on a compact domain, like our Laplacian, also has a discrete set of eigenvalues, lambda 1, lambda 2, lambda 3, and so on, and a set of orthogonal eigenfunctions, phi 1, phi 2, and so on. So we can also think about the eigenvectors and eigenvalues of such an operator, just like we think about them for a matrix. As a really simple example, let's consider the second derivative operator on the circle. So just the ordinary second derivative on the real line, except that we assume that all functions repeat after they reach 2 pi. Okay? In this case, it's pretty easy to show that the second derivative is self-adjoint. We basically just apply integration by parts twice to show that the integral of u v double prime is the same as the integral of u double prime v. And you can pretty quickly figure out that the eigenfunctions of the second derivative are sines and cosines. If I take the derivative of cosine nx twice, then I get minus n squared cosine nx, the same function again. And likewise for sine. The significance of these functions is that they provide a basis for functions on the circle. Just like the eigenvectors of a matrix provided a basis for n-dimensional space. So why is this cool and useful? Well, it really is the basis for all sorts of signal processing, for audio processing, for instance. So I can take any function at all, and I can now decompose it into these frequencies. So here I'm going to add up higher and higher frequencies until I get a good approximation of the function. And then by tweaking these different components of the function, I can filter it and manipulate it in a variety of ways. Okay, well, the cool thing about everything I just said is it's not specific at all to the second derivative operator. It works for the general Laplacian. So the Laplace-Beltrami operator on, let's say, any compact surface is going to have these nice eigenfunctions and eigenvalues. One important example of this is on the sphere. The eigenfunctions of the Laplacian are the spherical harmonics, which you might have seen in your chemistry class when talking about orbitals. Well, now you can do the same thing on whatever shape you like, on this bunny rabbit. You can compute eigenfunctions of the Laplacian, and you get these higher and higher frequency modes of vibration. And these are useful for all sorts of signal processing and geometry processing on surfaces. So there's a nice survey you can look at here to get a better sense of that. OK, let's now take a deeper look at the relationship between the Laplacian, the Dirichlet energy, and harmonic functions. And a way to motivate this is by the basic problem of interpolation. So interpolation means you're given a few data points or maybe you're given values on the boundary of a domain, and you want to figure out how the rest of the function should look. And obviously, there are a lot of possibilities. If all I know is the sampling of a function at a few points, there's lots of functions that it could have come from. So estimating this function is a basic task in statistics, where you might do scattered data interpolation. A method of interpolation that's closely related to what we'll talk about is something called a thin plate spline. This idea of interpolating data points is basically the central challenge in machine learning. So here, for instance, the Laplacian shows up in something called semi-supervised learning. In a physical setting, I can interpret this problem as finding the steady state solution for something where I'm given boundary values. So today we've talked, for instance, about the equilibrium heat flow. Previously we talked about soap films and minimal surfaces. 
And in geometry processing, there are all sorts of problems, shape editing, surface parameterization, and so forth, where some data is provided and the task is to fill in the rest by interpolation. Okay. To give a more specific problem, let's consider a region omega of the plane. And suppose that we have values on the boundary that are fixed. We want to find a function u, then, that's equal to these fixed values g on the boundary, and which fills in the interior of the domain as sort of smoothly as possible. Okay? Well, to solve this problem, we need to answer the question, what do we mean by as smoothly as possible? So there's a lot of different definitions you could use for what it means for function to be nice and regular. Um, one that is pretty uncontroversial is to say that kind of the smoothest possible function is one that's constant. Okay, So it'd be great if we could interpolate our boundary data with a constant function, but of course no constant function can interpolate different boundary values. Right. We could try to do something like what we've shown here, a piecewise constant function, but this has a huge jump in the middle. It's really not very smooth. So a different idea is to say, well, how about we look for a function that matches the boundary data and is also as close to constant as is possible. Okay? So this idea motivates the definition of the Dirichlet energy. The Dirichlet energy, E sub D, measures the failure of a function to be constant. We integrate over the whole domain the gradient of the function norm squared. If the function is constant or close to constant near u, then this value will be zero or close to zero. Okay? It'll be zero if the whole function is constant. And it'll be large in regions of the domain that change rapidly. So for this function u, which changes very quickly all over the place, the integrand of the Dirichlet energy looks like this. It has lots of large values. So our idea for finding a good interpolating function is to minimize the Dirichlet energy among functions that have the given boundary data. Okay, that sounds great, but how do we minimize Dirichlet energy? Right? We want to consider all possible functions and find the one that has the smallest energy. Well, as in ordinary calculus, our basic strategy for minimizing this energy is to set the derivative to zero and solve. Right? We look at the gradient of Dirichlet energy with respect to the input function u and try to find out where that's equal to zero. Now, a really nice thing is that because Dirichlet energy is convex, if we find such a point, we know that it will be the global minimizer of energy. Okay, And without too much work, we can show, as you will do in your homework, that the Dirichlet energy can be written in terms of the Laplacian. It can be written as this sort of quadratic form, integral of u Laplace u. And moreover, that minimizing this energy, setting the derivative to zero, gives a Laplace equation. Laplace u equals zero on the interior of the domain, and u is equal to g, the boundary data, on the boundary of the domain. Okay, and over on the right, we've plotted what this looks like. This is the minimizer of Dirichlet energy for this boundary data. Okay, so that's Dirichlet's principle. Dirichlet's principle says a function u minimizes Dirichlet energy if and only if it solves the Laplace equation. And actually, there's kind of an interesting historical anecdote here that people had used this Dirichlet principle for many years to make sense of problems in physics and geometry until Weierstrass came along and said, you know, actually, this principle has never been proven. So, for instance, I can cook up other energies where I can find a sequence of functions that get smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller, but never attain the minimum. And you haven't shown me that this won't happen with the Dirichlet principle. And because people were now so worried about this, they kind of gave up on Dirichlet's principle for a long time until Hilbert came along and really rigorously developed 
the machinery of functional analysis to show that Dirichlet's principle actually does make sense. And there's kind of a nice moral to this story in the last sentence of this paragraph that says, had the progress made with the use of the principle awaited Hilbert's work, a large segment of 19th century work on potential theory and function theory would have been lost. So kind of the moral of the story is to say, well, don't write off good intuition just because it hasn't yet been rigorously proven. And I think that's very much in the spirit of what we talk about in this class, what we talk about in discrete differential geometry. Working in the discrete setting can give you a lot of intuition for what's going on in the smooth setting, even if you don't see quite yet the precise connections, and vice versa. Thinking about the smooth setting can give you a lot of ideas about what to do in the discrete setting. Okay? So an important object connected to Dirichlet energy are these minimizers. Functions that minimize Dirichlet energy are called harmonic functions. And so there are a couple pictured here. These play a key role throughout geometry and physics, and we've already seen kind of a physical interpretation, which is this is the temperature distribution you get at a steady state. If I fix the boundary values and let the heat equation run for a very long time, I'll get one of these harmonic functions. These functions, because of the way we define the Laplacian, exhibit what's called a mean value property. So the value of a harmonic function u at any point x is equal to the average value over any ball b sub epsilon of radius epsilon around the point x. Right? So if I have this point on a harmonic function and I consider this little ball around x, x is going to be equal to the average value. And actually what's really cool, it's not just for small balls. If I make this ball bigger and bigger, it's still exactly equal to its average over that entire ball. Okay. Also, we could say it's equal to the integral over the boundary of the ball. Either one works. Because of this mean value property, we have a maximum principle, which says there are no extrema at interior points. I can't have a local maximum or a local minimum in a harmonic function because that maximum would be above the average value in a neighborhood. Right? So as a result, the maxima and minima of a harmonic function have to be found on the boundary of the domain. And you can understand that by looking at these two examples on the top. Right. Importantly, on the example on the right, the boundary is actually two circles, an inner and an outer circle. And the outer circle attains the minimum value, the inner circle obtains the maximum value. So, so far we've been drawing harmonic functions in the plane, but we can also do this on a curved surface. That's the beauty of having a Laplace Beltrami operator. So here we could, for instance, fix function values on some region A of the surface, set them to, let's say, plus or minus one, and then solve a Laplace equation using Laplace Beltrami that says Laplacian of u is equal to zero on m minus a, and u is equal to g on a. Okay, so again, you could imagine maybe to solve this, you start with some random function u, which has large Dirichlet energy, and you let heat flow take it to the smoothest function that has these boundary values. So here's what that looks like. So this is now a really powerful tool for interpolating data on curved surfaces. We can make things a little more interesting by putting something other than zero on the right-hand side of the equation. And that gives us what's called a Poisson equation instead of a Laplace equation. So recall that a Laplace equation is a stationary solution to the heat equation. And we can ask, well, what if we put a heat source somewhere inside the domain. Right? We have some function f that's non-zero somewhere inside the domain. Okay, So now we want to solve a modified heat equation, ddt of u equals Laplace u plus f on the interior. And on the boundary, we still have some boundary values, which maybe we think of as some kind of heat sink. Then after a long time, we get a different stationary distribution, 
And that stationary distribution is described by a Poisson equation. Laplace u equals minus f on the interior and u equals g on the boundary. And here's what that looks like for this particular problem. A nice way of thinking about the Poisson equation is in terms of what's called the harmonic greens function. So we can think about what the Poisson equation does if our heat source is just a single spike of heat on the right hand side. Or more precisely, if it's a Dirac delta at a point x. So now if we solve a Poisson equation, we get a very special function called the Green's function. So this Green's function, at least for this point x, is going to fall off smoothly around x. Okay? And since this is a linear equation, we can now get the solution for multiple spikes on the right-hand side by just summing up these Green's functions. Once we know what the Green's function looks like, at least in Rn, then we can solve our equation by summing Green's functions. So for instance, if on the right-hand side we have a sum of some constant ci times deltas at different points yi, then the solution to this equation is just going to be the sum of those same constants times the Green's functions shifted to those points. What this means more generally is that we can convolve any right-hand side with a Green's function to get the solution. So if we want to solve Laplace u equals f, then in fact all we have to do is a convolution. We integrate over the whole domain the Green's function centered at the current point times the function value at that point. Okay, And this is a really powerful idea that applies not only to the Poisson equation but to lots of partial differential equations. So solving a linear partial differential equation is equivalent to convolving with the fundamental solution or the Green's function for that equation. We can also understand the Poisson equation from a variational point of view, from the point of view of energy minimization. So like the Laplace equation, lots of Poisson equations arise from some energy. One really common example is, let's say we're given a vector field x, and we want to find a scalar potential, a scalar function, that best explains x. So we could think of this potential really as a energy and the vector field x as the force corresponding to this energy. Okay? To do this, we write down an energy like this. We say we want to look over all possible functions u. Which function u has a gradient that looks as much as possible like x. If we now go through the exercise of setting the gradient of this energy to zero, we get a Poisson equation that says, I want the Laplacian of u to be equal to the divergence of x. And here's what the solution looks like. So you can imagine if I now took the gradient of u, it would look a whole lot like the vector field x. In fact, if x actually came from the gradient of a function, then this Poisson equation will recover that function. Okay? So the key idea here is that we can use a Poisson equation to integrate a vector field. And that comes up all the time as a basic operation in geometry and image processing. Okay, let's now turn to talking about a very important and somewhat tricky subject of boundary conditions. So we've gotten a sense so far from our examples that the boundary data is very important in determining what the solution looks like. Right? For harmonic functions, for instance, it completely determined the answer. For minimal surfaces that we talked about when we looked at curvature, the boundary curves completely determine or almost determine what the shape of the final surface is. Okay? So they're really important. They're also often the trickiest part and, and the thing that's easiest to get wrong both mathematically and also in terms of implementation in code. What kinds of boundary conditions can we have? We've really, so far, only talked about one kind, Dirichlet conditions, which means we just fix the boundary values. But there's lots of other things we could ask for at the boundary. We could ask that the derivatives look a certain way, or that some mix of values and derivatives look a certain way, or we might look at higher order derivatives and so forth. And the key question when it comes to boundary conditions and partial differential equations is, 
when can a given set of boundary conditions even be satisfied? So let's start out by just looking at some easy one-dimensional examples, because even here there's some kind of interesting things to say. So in particular, let's look at an interval 0, 1. And on that interval, if we have two particular values that we want at 0 and at 1, well, there's lots of different functions that could match those values, right? No problem. And this is the basic picture you should have in your head for what somebody means when they say Dirichlet boundary conditions. They just mean they want to set the values on the boundary and then figure out what the inside, the interior of the function looks like. Okay? Similarly, on the boundary, we could, rather than prescribing values, we could prescribe derivatives. We could say, I don't care how high the function is at these points, but I do want the slopes to be a certain amount. So here's one function that has these two slopes, but here's another function with the same slopes and another one. Okay? So likewise, if somebody says Neumann boundary conditions, that means that the boundary derivatives are fixed. And then there's nothing stopping us from having a mixture of both Dirichlet and Neumann conditions. We could prescribe some values and some derivatives. For instance, on this uh, interval, we could say that the slope on the left side is prescribed and the value on the right side is prescribed. And there's plenty of functions that satisfy these conditions. So, so far, this doesn't seem very hard. We've put some data on our interval and we've asked that that be satisfied. And there's tons of different functions that satisfies our conditions. But what if we also have conditions on the interior of the domain? That's where things start to get tricky. Okay. So let's think now about a one-dimensional Laplace equation. For a 1D Laplace equation, can we always satisfy Dirichlet conditions? Right? So on this domain, with these boundary values, I want to find a function u whose second derivative is equal to 0. Can I do that? Can I always do that? Well, sure, it actually isn't too hard. So in 1D, solutions to this Laplace equation all look like this. They're just affine functions. u of x equals ax plus b for some constant a and constant b. Why can we always satisfy the Dirichlet boundary conditions? Well, because a line can interpolate any two points. No problem. OK, what about Neumann boundary conditions? Can we prescribe the derivative of the function at both ends of the interval? Well, no, this time it seems like there's going to be a problem, right? All the solutions we just said are straight lines. And so a line can only have one slope. There's no way in general we can control the derivative at both ends. OK? What if we now go up in dimension. Let's talk about a Laplace equation in 2D. And this time we want Dirichlet boundary conditions, so we want to solve Laplace u equals 0 on the interior of the domain, and on the boundary we want u to have some fixed values. Can we always satisfy these Dirichlet boundary conditions? Will this always work? Now this is a good opportunity to think about different interpretations we've given to the Laplace equation today. Okay, and if you think back to this way of looking at the Laplace equation saying, well, Laplace equation is the steady state or long time solution to the heat equation. So yes, it really seems we can always satisfy our Dirichlet boundary conditions. We have this heat at the boundary, and then we just let the temperature diffuse for a long, long, long time. Eventually, according to Dirichlet's principle, we will get a final function u 
that satisfies the Laplace equation and agrees with the boundary values. You have to be a little careful here. You can come up with pathological examples of crazy boundaries and crazy boundary data for which this doesn't work. But in general, things work out. Yes, you can solve a Laplace equation with any Dirichlet boundary conditions. What about Neumann boundary conditions? So now suppose that we instead prescribe the normal derivative along the boundary. In other words, we want to solve the equation Laplace u equals zero on the interior of the domain and du dn, the normal derivative, is equal to some given function h on the boundary of the domain. Right? So just at each point on the boundary, I have some number, and that's the magnitude of the normal derivative that I'd like to see. Can we always find a solution to this Laplace equation? Does it always exist? Well, the key tool to use here is the divergence theorem. Remember, the divergence theorem kind of says, if I have a vector field on a domain, well, kind of what goes in must come out. Right? The total flux through the boundary must be equal to the total divergence on the interior. OK? So let's take our Laplace equation, Laplace u equals zero, and let's go ahead and integrate it over the whole domain. I'm gonna start on the right side and say, the integral over the whole domain of zero, which is equal to zero, should be equal to the integral over the interior of the Laplacian of u. Okay? If u satisfies our Laplace equation, this will be true. We can rewrite the Laplacian as the divergence of the gradient, as we talked about today. And then using the divergence theorem, we can say, oh, but that's the same as just integrating over the boundary of the domain, the normal dot the gradient of u. Well, the normal dot with the gradient of u is the normal derivative. And so what this whole equation says altogether is in order for this equation to be solvable, the integral of our boundary data h over the whole boundary has to be equal to zero. We can only solve this equation if h integrates to zero over the boundary. Okay? So just as in 1D, we can't solve a Neumann boundary value problem for all possible data. More generally, this is something to really watch out for when you're solving these kinds of equations, when you're solving partial differential equations. You can't just throw whatever data you want in there and hope that something meaningful will come out. Right? You might set up an interpolation problem that actually doesn't make sense. And this is a really common source of errors in code, but also in thinking when people are trying to formulate algorithms in terms of partial differential equations and geometry. You really have to think through, is the problem I'm setting up ill-posed? Because quite often the computer won't tell you. It'll go ahead and it'll produce some kind of answer that it thinks is what you want, even though the problem you've defined doesn't actually mean anything. Okay, we'll talk a little bit more about that when we talk about discretization. So, to summarize, we've said a lot today about Laplace Beltrami. And hopefully, even if you don't follow every little detail, this gives you some pretty good intuition for what the Laplacian is. The high level is that the Laplacian is a fundamental object used throughout geometry, physics, and computer science. We saw that there are many different definitions in the smooth setting. But the most basic idea, which really helps to provide a lot of intuition, is that the Laplacian of a function measures the deviation of, of that function from a local average. We also said that the Laplacian is closely connected to the Dirichlet energy, which is a basic measurement of smoothness or regularity, and that this energy is minimized by doing a long time heat flow. When this heat flow becomes stationary, we know that we will have minimized that energy. By Dirichlet's principle, 
we know that this minimizer is also a solution to the Laplace equation. Laplace u equals zero, subject to fixed or Dirichlet boundary conditions. In general, we saw that we really have to think carefully about boundary conditions. We can't just throw whatever we want in there and hope to get a meaningful solution. And that can really trip us up in practice. All right, so that's it for the smooth side of things. Next time, we're going to talk about the discrete Laplace operator and how that really turns out to be kind of a Swiss Army knife for all sorts of geometry processing.